the Grand Center Miami, and they'll probably tag you in it. Hello, everyone who is watching, and who everyone who's going to watch later, and everyone who's going to be tuning in later. Welcome, welcome to, I don't know what to call this. <laughs> What's the special edition of the Blockchain Center Art and Influence, talking about how art affects our, uh, our lives and the different aspects that art can reveal of society in general, because it's often been said that artists are like antennas that receive you know, what's happening, even though they don't really know how to process it and they put it through the art. So it's kind of like you know, Cassandra, a clairvoyance of what's happening, uh, the zeitgeist of the times. Mm. Very, very true, right? Artists are the ones that, that just kind of, you know how they have jesters in the old days? They were the ones who were allowed to make jokes at the king and they were the only ones that couldn't get in trouble because they were supposed to be the funny comedians. Art is similar to that, to where it's like you can depict what's happening in society and not necessarily get in trouble because it's always people's interpretations. So Johnny Dollar is a great artist, great anarchist. Here is his book at the Blockchain Center. And uh, he's going to show you some cool stuff that he did with this picture. But we live in digital times, in digital art times as well. Um, so we're just going to do so, look through some of your paintings, Johnny, okay. and then um, discuss. Like you painted these, I know a while ago, but the things that you've envisioned, they've all really come to pass. So definitely want to talk about that. Cool. Um, yeah, let's start with. Uh this painting. Okay. Yeah, perfect. So do you want to explain what this one means to you? Uh, well, I call this one uh, Kisses on Main Street. I painted this one on George Orwell's birthday uh, a few years ago. Um, but that has been a theme. I've just been seeing surveillance and cameras around. And if you want to reach out, yeah, sorry. It's, sorry, it's, sorry. It's, it sort of speaks for itself. I really. Um, like I said, like to get y'all's take on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, what is George Orwell's birthday? What is the like? You know, the, the exact day. I yeah. have to look at my uh, Instagram when I put this out. Okay, so. okay, okay. And George Orwell is writes what COVID nineteen eighty four is that what he writes? Yeah. What did he write that makes George Orwell so famous? That was nineteen eighty four and a great one called uh, Animal Farm which is mm. often not mentioned, but that's kind of more relevant, I feel, to where we are. George Orwell is one of those like books that everybody would burn if they could. Not everybody, but the powers that be. Absolutely. Well, actually, they'll keep a copy for themselves as a user man. Oh, wow. Well, was, uh, what was that? Was that yesterday? Two days? Or uh, last week? Five, last week? Yeah, George Orwell. Happy late birthday, dude. Five days late. <laughs> but nice. this, is, this is an honor of you. Yeah, so yeah, no, just talking about the picture. Um, so yeah, obviously, you know, uh, surveillance state, that's definitely, you know, that's something described in 1984, like the um, TVs were watching the people um, as a, while the people watched the TVs. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we can, uh, can definitely see that uh, happening today especially things like the Patriot Act, which, um, you know, basically gets rid of um, the Fourth Amendment. So unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, they're basically able to uh, go through a secret court and uh, basically spy on uh, anybody they want, which is um, which is a pretty big uh, political event going on right now um, with uh, that same court and procedure. Uh, being used against the Trump campaign. So it's uh, definitely extremely relevant. Um, when did you paint this, Johnny? I painted this about five years ago. Okay, yeah. I've done uh, different iterations of it, but the, the first one was about five years ago. Wow, that's really wild, because if you do think about the surveillance state and what's happening right now, uh, with COVID-1984 happening, right, which is so Orwellian, everything that's occurring, you're seeing... Now on your iPhone, if you pull it up, there's like a COVID-19 tracker mm. and you can turn it on or off. And it says that uh, basically what it does is it, it has phones read other phones and it will warn you if you're around somebody who's tested positive for COVID-19. Now, what's interesting is there have been some governors, I'm going to say Maine or Massachusetts starts with an M, who have come out saying that uh, we're going to use this type of testing on people who are protesting. Mm. Now, as we know, as you guys both know, 
it never stops at one thing. It's never like, okay, wear a mask and you'll be safe. It's like, wear a mask. And then it's like a year later, you know, get a shot. And then a year later, get this chip inserted into your hand, right? Mm -hmm. And so definitely the surveillance state is is being socially acceptable because everybody's afraid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, obviously that's um, the uh, uh, Egalian uh, dialectic. It's... Um, Basically, it's a, a, a structure um, used uh, by the ruling class in order to get the public to beg to have their rights taken away. So we could see that in Nazi Germany, they had the Reichstag fire where they burned down the main uh, German government building. They blamed it on a lone communist. And then they used that to, pa to pass the Reichstag fire decrees, which uh, not only cracked down on German civil rights, but also uh, Hitler's uh, opponents in the media. So we can we can see a similar thing um, with, again, the uh, the Patriot Act and, of course, um, basically what happened in the media afterwards, as far as any dissentor, uh, any anybody who dissented against the Iraq war or spoke out against it um, were basically fired. I believe is uh, Phil Donahue, I want to say, was the um, I believe he was on uh, it was like a daytime talk show. Or yeah, yeah, he was on one of the big net networks, and um, they denied originally that he was fired because he was speaking out against the Iraq war, but later it came out um, in leaked memos that it 100% was. Yeah, so, and yeah. also to here, I'm going to turn this Johnny see if it's get some better lighting on you. Um, but we're all we're all in the same room right now. <laughs> yeah. But so, like, in modern times, right, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing two things. We're seeing... This, this earn it bill, which we're going to talk about briefly and how that really portrays to this picture. And then we're seeing in China, right? I think that they say that for every one person in China, there's two cameras. And by the year 20 something, it's going to be five cameras per person. And there's a story that I heard when Scott and I went to New York for the Human Rights Foundation. And it was talking about this girl who um, she, in, in China, they use public shaming as like a method to, to get people to get in line. Mm -hmm. And they do this in public schools in America. You know, that's their, their, their type of, um, how do you say their type of, of discipline is just shame. Mm -hmm. So there were pictures of this girl all over China saying that she's super bad because she keeps breaking the law by jaywalking. And they had taken a picture of her face. Now, in reality, this woman her face, they were taking a picture of her face while it was in the crosswalk multiple times, right? But in reality, this woman's face was on the side of a bus on an ad. And so she would, it would look like she was jaywalking, but in reality, she was just like, her face was on the side of a bus, right? So this is the world that we're moving towards. I mean, if you look at that picture, Johnny, what does this mean? This couple here that has the, um, has this red. Uh, you know, it's a lot of it's, Sublim subconscious mm -hmm. where these ideas come from. Like I could give you my interpretation now, but if you'd asked me five years ago, it'd have been a different interpretation. Yeah. If you get what I'm saying, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, really, I was re I was uh, rereading a 1984 at the time. A lot was going on. Um, and I was really getting into privacy. Like I've been in it for about ten years, but really getting into it. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the couple's trying to hide, you know, mm -hmm. you can't do anything without being spied upon. I mean, yeah. But something I want to note about privacy, because I called myself a privacy advocate for a while, and I was really like trying to teach people about privacy and advocating for, you know, Linux and open source mm -hmm. and free open source for years. And then I've kind of pulled back from that. And one okay. of the reasons was I got pushback from people. I was actually surprised how many people did not like privacy. Mm -hmm. There's a certain percentage of the population, you probably know people that like, no closed doors in my house type of attitude. And they also feel like, why do you need privacy if you have nothing to hide? Mm -hmm. um, and we all know like nothing, if you if you have nothing to hide, soon leads to nowhere to hide. Mm -hmm. um, as we, you know, all this stuff, and really privacy is about the future. It's yeah. not about what you did, it's about what you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. If they can follow you, monitor you, see every how you react to different situations, they can put different things in front of you or different different stimuli. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, your news feed or whatever. You got you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I think I think just to get on that point of if you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to fear, like that that saying. 
Um, I think what people miss about that is, is in America, we kind of have this idea that, you know, our government we have now would never do something against the people or take away our rights. You know, we like to think that the Bill of Rights is, is, uh, you know, a hundred percent bulletproof. Yeah. Yeah. And they never consider the, the idea that, you know, if we, you know, with the surveillance state we have even right now, um, if there did come a time where you were, uh, the government did something you didn't like and you started speaking out against it, well, you don't have anything to hide per se, but you have an opinion that's, um, that is, uh, you know, not the same as the government. So they have an incentive to uh, punish you in some way. Absolutely. And they have, um, you know, complete control. And, and since the Patriot Act, um, which was actually the original, the uh, bill, like, you know how the Patriot Act came out very quickly mm-hmm. um, after 9-11. And so there was public it was, support. It was, it was uh, written beforehand, and it was actually the basis for the Patriot Act was actually uh, presented by uh, Joe Biden in 1995. So these uh, these restrictions and, um, and you know, the eroding of our civil rights has, has been in the works for a long time. And... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you know, one thing to note is, you know, uh, the Netherlands, you mm-hmm. know, Holland was one of the best places for Jews to live mm-hmm. for like 500 years. Okay. And uh, they kept excellent records as the Dutch do, you know, of census of who lived where they knew how many of everybody, how many Jews lived everywhere and where at, and they lived great. They lived good lives. As soon as the Nazis rolled in and took over the Netherlands, they had all these records. Yeah. They, I mean, the, the Jews in the Netherlands suffered worse than they did in Germany yeah. or any place, you know, or Poland because they knew where they were. They had all the records. And that's kind of like talking about privacy. Governments change. Leading mm-hmm. on to what Drew said, things change. Yeah. It's very uh, true. I, I think that's a great point because I did just say something about Joe Biden. So I'd like to, you know, make it uh, bipartisan here. Um, when people get like, uh, they get excited about Trump. You know, right wingers get excited about Trump. Come on, Trump! Like, crack down on these protesters. It's time to time to get the National Guard in there. Um, you know, martial law. Let's get it going. And I think it's important to remember, like what Johnny said, is even if you like the president that's currently in charge or your leader that's currently in charge, when you give that uh, presidential position, when you give it more power then in the future, you basically open yourself up to, you know, somebody you don't like getting yeah. those same powers. And I think that um, I think that kind of uh, happened to a lot of uh, people on the left wing um, when Trump took power, because uh, yeah. Obama expanded a lot of the executive powers. And then when Trump took over, they're like, oh, no, we gave like, why didn't you yeah. worry about this beforehand? Yeah, because they thought they had it in the bag like mm-hmm. they do now. You know, so definitely you need to make sure that who's in government you need to make it equal just in case this person does come on the opposite side. And it's interesting because I hear people now that are Trump supporters saying that, uh, that he's going to, we want him to be president for more than eight years. And I'm like, I would never ever want that as much as I might like or dislike a, ca- a candidate. We, there is a reason why there's a cycle right mm-hmm. now, just to the back to the initial point of privacy. I mean, there is a weird thing where it's like people are very defensive about people who like their privacy, but you have to think of it in terms of like right now we have a camera here recording everything that we're saying, right? If you knew that there was a camera recording every single one of your conversations, you would not speak the same. And that's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And then I was listening this morning to uh, some just note and stuff. And I mean, think about Facebook, think about how it was a little interesting when Facebook came to see to, to play because beforehand we all used screen names, something interesting that was kind of our name or like kind of something we liked. But then Facebook came around and it became normal and trendy to use your first and last name as your screen name. Now, what Facebook has is a record of every single video you watched, every single comment you've made. Your, your friends, who's closest to you. They know how long you lingered on an image without even clicking on it. Exactly. They, yeah, no, it's, yeah. I that, quit Facebook about five years ago around that time. But the thing that triggered me to quit was when it came out, you might remember this, like they got exposed for manipulating their user's feed to try to make them sad or angry. Wow. No, this is a like, social like, experiment. Yeah, yeah, it was like they were experimenting because people are more, you're more apt um, 
for suggestion when you're emotionally charged. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you're more apt to buy something mm-hmm. when they get you emotionally charged. That's, you know, that's why marketers will make you sad or angry mm-hmm. and then they give you a solution. Yeah. So, you know, Facebook was just seeing what they could do. And I was like, man, someone's getting sad and upset. And what was it that I found out? And that, that's when I was like, I, I, it, that was like the final straw. Yeah. That just made me go, okay, this is, this is way too beyond or what. Yeah, you know, it's a game. Maybe you press the like button, you get a little bit of endorphins. It's a game. I mean, you know, I like to. Th- I always like to think we have free will. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of times I feel like I'm just like a meat computer. You know, I just push buttons. Oh, okay. You know, th- if this happens, then I do this. You know, yeah. I do believe we have more control, but you have to be cognizant of it. You have to be aware because yeah. otherwise, you know, we're running on autopilot. Yeah, hundred percent of the time. Yeah, yeah, and I think so. There's two points I like to make uh, with what we were just talking about. So first, there's this uh that concept that we were talking about we were talking about it earlier how they can use fear to take away uh civil rights and increase their surveillance state um and and then you were talking about um emotions you know making you irrational it kind of gets past your logical brain Mm -hmm. gets into your lizard brain and uh, then you make reactions that you wouldn't normally otherwise if you weren't in an increased emotional state so both of those have to do with um with uh, propaganda, not just, you know, the general word propaganda, but the the book titled Propaganda that was written by Edward Bernays in 1928. And he was, he's known as the father of propaganda. His methods were literally used by Hitler's Third Reich to create Hitler's cult of personality. Um, And those tactics are still being used to this day. Um, For instance, uh, so Edward Bernays, he was the uh, great nephew of Sigmund Freud, the famous psychologist. So he used uh, Sigmund Freud's sci- uh, psychology to uh, be used in both government and advertising. Uh, for instance, he uh, publicized or he made it popular for women to smoke. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was one of his biggest advertising campaigns. And uh, I believe it was with Lucky Strike. Liberty Torches. Yeah, or uh, uh, Torches of Freedom. Virginia Slims. Yeah. They were. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Yeah. They, they had that campaign for a long time. You've come a long way, baby, because they, they walked, you know, like women were supposed to smoke or unladen. Mm-hmm. So this was like a stand for, you know, strong womanhood to smoke cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, was a, it was a great play, you know, mm-hmm. like, like bacon. Believe it or not, I, I, I love bacon, but, you know, uh-huh. bacon's like this manly food. And it, they've sexualized it, though. It's so weird. <laughs> But yeah, it was a campaign. Like, yeah. It wasn't a normal thing to eat bacon at every meal. But yeah. they made it like this is a manly thing. Uh, you know, so it's, it's very interesting, you know, how we're easily manipulated. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. And and to give you uh, another example of the way his these same tactics were used, you know, after he does this, um, you know, getting women to smoke campaign, then he helps the CIA orchestrate a coup in Guatemala in 1954. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting is now that they have all of this data on us, these methods, these methodologies of the book propaganda can now be used super accurately, right? In targeting everyone. So which is why like data scientists is like a hot job right now, because you're just sifting through everyone's data, 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 whatever the fuck it's called. And data is more, more expensive than oil. It is the most expensive commodity right now. But how is it that we are continually and willingly and, and addicted to giving our data to these centralized platforms like Facebook while they make all the money, right? You know, like they say, if you don't pay for a product, you are the product. Free is never really free, you guys. Get, get off Gmail. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all right, so next, next picture. Actually, before we do that, I do want to share my screen because uh, you t- you talked about the um, the Patriot Act, right? Patriot Act super important. By the way, when we say Patriot Act and we talk about people being suspected to be terrorists, we're not talking about Muslims. I just need to make that clear. Okay, we're talking about U.S. citizens. The Patriot Act. The big thing that they did there was they made it so that hi Scott. Uh, they just made it. They made it so that people who were suspected of being terrorists, even if you were a US citizen, they could indefinitely detain you and you were stripped of your rights. And this is the problem with the Patriot Act. It happened post 9-11 and it had a lot of support because it had this wonderful name of Patriot Act, but in reality, it took away a lot of the rights that you were afforded as an as a citizen. And the other problem with that is like, who's to say what a terrorist is? Like there is no definition for that. So they could slap a label on you. Like us three probably would be in trouble right now. So the second iteration of this Patriot Act is now in play. 
And why? I mean, it's because people are afraid. And there's a, a saying that says when people are afraid, they are more willing to give up their rights in, in order to achieve some sense of security, but you're really not more secure. Uh, but do you want to talk about this a little bit, the EFF, which is the Electronic Frontier Foundation. You guys should check this out if you're interested. Um, but the Earn It Bill. Yeah, so I'm not super um, well read up on the details of the act. I'm just I just know that it is uh, essentially the biggest thing is that it I believe it bans end to end encryption completely, mm -hmm. um, which is end to end encryption is basically the only way that we have given that the internet uh, is you know uh, it's able to be uh, spied on you know with the Patriot Act. Uh, the only way you can actually communicate privately is if you're um, sending messages that are encrypted on both sides. So even if somebody intercepts it in the middle, what they're getting is some unreadable um, uh, encrypted message. So they can't even tell what you're talking about. So that's what this earn it bill is about. And um, yeah, they're trying to they're trying to slide it by right now. I don't even know if they have any like way to directly uh, apply it to what's going on right now. I know a bit about it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so you can't get rid of encryption because you destroy the internet. Yeah. Uh, encryption used to be illegal, by the way. It was considered a weapon for a long time. Yeah. Um, because you know, for, for spying, so it was a really big deal to take encryption technology overseas. Uh, bill Clinton passed a bill that made it not a law, um, not made it legal, so you could do digital payments online. Okay. Without you know encryption, you couldn't do credit card payments, and that's really what made the internet take off. You could make sales on the internet. So really, there, our modern world can't live without encryption. What this bill does, it means there has to be backdoors. You can have encryption, mm -hmm. but the government has to have a backdoor to all of them, including like your iPhone. Like your iPhone, if you know if they take it, they can't le you know legally hack it. They can't hack it. Mm -hmm. You know, they they're able to. But now they would have a backdoor. Mm -hmm. You know, all manufacturers would have to have a backdoor. You know, a law enforcement can get in. Maybe that's your county sheriff, whatever. Um, but that's kind of where it goes. Yeah, and, yeah. No, that's that's a good point. So, guys, like, use use Signal if you can. You know, because that's that's an end-to-end -end encrypted device. But if they're allowed a backdoor, that that doesn't make any sense to me. But the other thing that's interesting about the Earn It Bill is that they are taking away. It used to be that a platform was not responsible for the comments made. So, for example, YouTube is not responsible for the comments made on the videos of the people that are posting it. But what this bill is doing is it's now making it so that way these individual platforms have to become the arbiters of truth on their individual platform and oh, censor really? the comments. So it's a little bit wild because it's almost supporting this idea where like sometimes I post stuff on Twitter and it just disappears. Right. And I'm like, I know I posted that picture and it's just gone. Obviously it's not a selfie because they want people to be conceited into themselves. It's, it's political stuff that I post. It just deletes, but it's interesting. So guys, if you can, and it, it so sucks that this is the, the platform, you know, tell your Senator to vote. No, call your senators. This is really the only recourse that we have right now. Uh, but just do it. Like just do it. Cause we can't do this anymore. We cannot have our rights continue to be infringed upon because guess what? They did not make the internet and they can't, they can't put rules on it. Just like they didn't make the beach and they can't tell me to not go to the beach. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Next picture, Johnny. Oops. Add yours. Perfect. Okay. This painting is called family dinner. Um, it was inspired by, uh, you know, uh, Thanksgiving dinner with my family uh, a couple of years back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of my art's about technology and how we interact with it and, uh, and it, you know, changes us. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that technology not only be digital, analog, pharmaceutical, um, you know, linguistic, you know, you name it. So that is kind of, uh, that's the theme of that painting. I mean, like, what do you think? What do you see in that? So I think the first thing I noticed was uh, the woman standing at the end there with the uh, turkey is like see-through, like a ghost. So I guess that would be a reflection of the fact that nobody's attention is on her. So we've got, it looks like everybody's on phones with their head down. The guy at the end is pouring some booze and everybody's got a pharmaceutical bottle in front of them. Wow. Um, 
So yeah, yeah, I guess that speaks to um, just like the constant altered states um, that like humanity is in um, and like the distractions. Yeah, diverted attention as well, yeah. Yeah, definitely important. And then you have these outside, just huge pollution that's going on, surveillance states going on and people are just on their phones. <laughs> so there's I'm, some of the food on the table. Are they growing weed on the table? Wow. <laughs> it's my kind of people. <laughs> I mean, there is no food on the table. And there's, this is a cockroach or like a, a, a praying so, mantis. It is praying mantis. Wow. Oh, interesting. What's the, what's the book? It's uh, the Tao Te Ching. Oh, interesting. What I, uh, I've heard the name. What is, what's the book about? Uh, it's just it's the way uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the book of changes. Okay. Um, it's uh, the, I mean, it's the main text of Taoism. Okay. And it's really just a, like a full, like a how to live book. Mm -hmm. Really. It's uh, one of those, if you can explain it, you're not explaining it. And if someone is explaining it, they're not explaining it. You know, type of thing. Is uh, it is it written like a collection of I think I like uh like kind of like poetry like short like short stanzas, short okay. poems. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very awesome. interesting. And there's a Venus flytrap on the table. Oh, okay. Nice. Because it eats its food. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's really important to note too, that like everybody's on their phones. It's supposed to be a family dinner, but everybody's in their own worlds. Now this is a question to the both of you guys. Like, I remember, like, it used to not be like this. People would have to have interactions around the dinner table. And, you know, especially now with social distancing, everybody keep that magic six number of feet away from each other. People are retreating into their own worlds. They're becoming dehumanized. So that means if you do have to kill somebody because you've seen it on TV happen so many times, the likelihood of you doing that becomes much easier because in your brain you've subliminally seen it and so therefore you think that uh, it, it's just not as big of a feat to kill somebody. Um, now, I guess my question is, do you guys think that people, or so I saw a picture once where it was like, people have always been like this and it was a, a group of men standing in line and they were all reading the newspaper, nobody was talking sure. to each other. So do you think that people have always been like this and it's worse now because we have the technology that uh, pushes for it, or do you think that we are being, we're just being programmed to be more self-absorbed? It's way worse because your paper didn't look at you back. Yeah. It didn't bing and give you serotonin boosts. It did, you know what I mean? It did have, um, wasn't addictive. Mm -hmm. You know, your phone is addictive. You know, it, yeah. it, it's, and it's, it's well known. I mean, like I'll listen to Tristane Harris used to work for Google and he was talking about, you know, you know, he worked with the ethics department at Google. He quit. Mm -hmm. um, but he was talking about, you know, how, you know, different ways to make the phone less addictive. Because, like, the algorithm, he kept using this word, your brainstem. The, you know, the Google YouTube algorithm is going straight for your brainstem. Um, he was, like, one of the main key things I got out of this, and I'd like it be good to share, was he's like, because he's like, he's like, so, you know, you wake up, you do your thing, and you just want to look on YouTube for 15 minutes. Two hours later, you're looking at Jordan Peterson videos and you're going, what, what happened to the time? And I was like, oh my God, he's talking about me. And I look around, everyone's just nodding their heads saying, yeah, me. And I was like, holy crap, I'm not alone. I felt like I was weak, like it was my willpower. But he was like, no, it's the algorithm. It's not a person. It's an algorithm. It doesn't care. It doesn't care about you. It just wants your attention. It's constantly learning, going at your brainstem. Mm -hmm. So he talked about like, one, you know, he was like 80% of YouTube views are thumbnail clicks, not searches. He's like, you just see an image and you click on it. Pretty face, you click on it. Don't even, you click on it before your brain even processes what it is. Mm -hmm. So it was like, turn off your thumbnails. Get a plugin that turns off YouTube thumbnails. I tried it, man. My YouTube use went way down. I mean, I was I had to have to actively search. It wasn't just click on. I mean, the, the thumbnail, the images, the words were on the side, but yeah. not that in picture. It's interesting. Uh, yeah, it was, it was really important. The other thing you mentioned was if you want to make your phone less addictive, there's a feature called uh, grayscale. You can make it chromatic, mm -hmm. so it's just black and white and gray, and it makes it way, way less addictive. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, chromatic. Yeah. I'm going to have to ask you how to change my app settings because okay, well, that's yeah, yeah. cool. Right. Yeah, chromatic. I've never heard that. That's a really good tip. 
for sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, phones are addicting though, guys. I mean, they definitely are. And I think that I, I've been to some restaurants lately that, cause you know, Florida is the best. And so we've opened up earlier than most states. If you do not like this, then just leave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, and it's not that it's not, that, it's not like, you know, I hate when people like say you should try to affect change, but here's the thing. There are options of places in the United States that are following what you would like. If you like those places, move there. If you like what's happening in Florida, we welcome you here. So don't try to make everything all the same because there's definitely value and choice. Um, but what I've been seeing in restaurants is now like these games where you put all of your phones into bins or you put them all into side things so people will be forced to have conversation. But I think it's important, especially for people that are parents, to just like set the example for your kids and like make sure and make it a point and be very intentional to have times where you're with your family and you're speaking to them and you're actually having meaningful conversation. If you need to go online and Google like, hey, these are good questions that I can ask my kids, do that. But be very intentional because we are fighting a, a pretty big battle right now, I would say. Yeah, and I would say, you know, with the ask the questions, like I've run into people that, you know, you might meet a person and they'll come to you like, hey, how are you doing? Uh, how's work? How's this? And they're like, you can tell they're really trying to engage in conversation, mm -hmm. but they're just reading the list of questions yeah. instead of paying attention. Yeah. You know, like sometimes, you know, I'm a jerk and somebody asks me a question, I'll just throw an oddball answer at them to see if they, if they respond. Because yeah. sometimes they're like, oh, fine. Yeah. You know, like, you know, you, you know what I'm saying. So yeah. with your kids, with your family, take a breath before you do it and really pay attention. Mm -hmm. To the moment. I mean, I, I, you know, that is maybe a, a Taoist Zen thing, but I mean, we can all really get lost in our head and what's happening next. Mm -hmm. What am I going to say next? No, pay attention to what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of a concept, you know, we've been talking about it in a, um, you know, like a family context, but it reminds me of a concept from uh, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, and that was just uh, basically just says active listening. Like actually, um, when you ask somebody a question or when you're talking to them, give them a legitimate, uh, you know, actually care about what they're saying and listen to them, eye contact, like actually, uh, and ask them further questions. And that, it, it goes for, you know, uh, not only does that make you a great business person and a better networker, um, because ultimately people just like to talk about themselves. Sure. So if you yeah. can, the more that you can get somebody to talk about themselves to you, the, the more, more they, they like you. Yeah, they feel connected, that they've had an exchange with you, that they've deposited some of their self into you. So that totally makes sense. Yeah, no, I read that book and, and I avoided it for a long time because it seemed, sounded manipulative and this mm -hmm. and that. But when you read it, you're like, oh, this is just how to be a better person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, pay attention to people. Yeah. Listen to what they're saying. Ask them questions. It's really just like, oh, don't be such a narcissistic bastard and pay attention to other people live in the moment mm -hmm. and you actually live your life. Yeah. Your life is now, you know, your life is the conversations where, you know, if you get what I'm saying, like every moment you have is, is the moment is your life, you know, like the future. Like, I mean, that's fear. Like when you're scared, you're thinking about the future. Yeah. When you're angry, you're, you're probably thinking Think about, about the past. past. Yeah. But when you're like in the moment, that's when you find joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So let's all take a deep breath right now. Reset our immune systems. Everyone breathe in deep. Hold it in. You would be surprised at how, I mean, it really, it resets your nervous system. You would be surprised at how much better, like I probably feel right now too. <laughs> just taking a deep breath. Just hopefully, take a deep hopefully breath. the people watching did the same. I know. Hopefully you guys did too. So um, one more thing that I do want to talk about that I completely forgot. Oh, yeah. Mental health, just just on this on this screen, right? S especially what's happening, is, and with this picture, especially with what's happening in the world right now, we have to take our brains, our mental health, our subconscious mind into account. I think a lot of times we're taking, you know, uh, everyone's like not we, because not the people in this room, obviously, but the the rules of social distancing, the rules of wear your mask those might seem outwardly effective to remain healthy. However, fear is a huge detractor to your health. 
you know, and maybe it's not as physical. Maybe you're not coughing because of fear, but your brain matters. Right. And then mm -hmm. I, I know I was listening to a video yesterday about social distancing and how the United Nations actually outlawed social distancing as a form of torture when you capture, you know, people from another, from an opposing country. Yeah. yeah. They've, they've actually mandated it. You're not allowed to do social distancing anymore. And, um, I, I can see his face, but I can't remember his name, but he's a great war hero. He like ran for president and stuff before. Um, he like McCain. visited, what'd you say, Matt? John McCain. John McCain, the, the boy knows. I thought you were going to say Jesse Ventura. <laughs> no, but John McCain, he war hero and stuff. And he said that out of all of the things they did to torture him, social distancing was the worst. So I can only imagine young kids, what it's doing for you when you, I, when your parents yell at you, when you walk down the street and you don't have a mask and guess what? You're also poisoning yourself because you're breathing your own CO2, right? So definitely guys, we got to take, um, we have to take mental health into account. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So next picture, Johnny. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Um, how about we do this? One? Uh, Danielle says, we came to this world to learn how to interact with others. That is the only thing we can take with us. Good point. Nice. Uh, you got to share it again. Okay. Really yes. Bottom. I'm going to, I didn't tell you I was doing this one, but I want to show this. Yeah, no, please show it. Drew Tang. Apparently you are the man. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. I like this picture. You had this up on the wall of the center earlier. This. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and explain this one. This okay. one is called uh, Corn in the Barbarian. Um, it's, you know, obviously a, a homage to uh, Conan, uh, you know, a, a great character, um, as well as comics. But it's also a homage to uh, collectible cards. So I used to do these art for these uh, card games. One of them was called Bitcoin. <laughs> and they would do these collectible cards. Um, and I made this one to mimic it so it's you know not only is it you know it's made to look like photoshop all these images are different canvases that were mounted onto one canvas um, and it has a uh an open dime hardware wallet embedded within it Very cool. which has some cryptocurrency as well as a certificate of authenticity and a token an nft of the painting in the painting mm -hmm. That's the painting of itself, you know, um, and I try to make it aesthetically pleasing. But what what inspired this painting on another level was I went to a conference. It was an AI conference, and there was four smart people on stage, very smart, and they were all talking about how AI was going to just take over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, two of them were for it, two of them were against it, but they were all like, "It's happening, no matter what. AI is taking over the world." And you know, I tried to ask a question, but there's a, Big, big conference and I didn't get my question asked mm -hmm. but afterwards I thought about it and I was like you know that's all bullshit you know excuse my language it's just technocrats these four you know really smart technocrats on stage that you know technology you know they're smarter than everyone else you know they're smart but they're like oh you know technology is going to take over the world and I got to thinking I was like that's BS that's just technological hubris mm -hmm. whether it be the Sumerians you know, the tall texts, the ancient Egyptians, the Romans, they all thought their great technology would last with forever. With the greatest, yeah. Yeah, with their, you know, and, but no, what brought them down every time? The mm. barbarian. Okay. So, you know, and they, you know, they'll, and you know, they can be responsible. Well, it's different this time. I bet they said that every time. It's different every time. Yeah. You know, and, you know, history's on my side. And, you know, this is, you know, half jest, but you know, I do believe it. I believe there's a switch in our brains that we aren't built for this technological stuff. You know, this technology, you know, it's all inundating us has taken over our humanity. But you know, I believe there's a switch in every man and woman mm -hmm. that sooner or later we just snap and that barbarian is within us. Yeah. You know, just to like to reset or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of what inspired this painting. And it's you know it's Corden, he's fighting an a Cerebus, the three-headed dog, but it's the surveillance camera. That's you know, so cool. It's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely. So, okay, you said a word, technocrats, right? Yes. You want to explain that a little bit? Yeah, so technocrats, um, the idea of a technocracy is that it's a civilization run by, um, by the uh, people who are the smartest. Um, so how that applies in... Uh, 
in modern civilization is, for instance, uh, we have Bill Gates, who is unelected, um, but somehow he has managed to not only take control of and fund most of our uh, international medical establishment, uh, he also gets to dictate essentially what our response is to a global pandemic, um, which is interesting. Uh, and that's that's an example of um, uh, basically this idea of technocrats, which are pushed extremely hard in pop culture. Like, um, I would say all of Silicon Valley is yeah. most of it's run by technocrats. Mm -hmm. that, it's, it's basically, it's like we have all of these unelected officials that are making decisions for us, even though we never elected them, but it's because they have control of technology, Correct. right? So you have Bill Gates as a prime example. No, Bill Gates, who is, this is hard for me to say to you because I'm a Gates scholar. So he paid for my college. So I'm like, oh, wow. great, awesome. You're cool, Bill. But now it's like, he's never been a doctor in a day in his life, but now he gets to make all these decisions on how we get to dictate our health. And then, you know, another good example is like your, your, uh, we talked about Bezos, right? Mm -hmm. You know, here, here's a person who is ahead of the game in technology, but somehow the government mandates that all of the mom and pop shops close down and Amazon's the only form of commerce that we can use. Mm -hmm. It's like, that doesn't make any sense because look at all the outbreaks that have happened at different Amazon locations. And you think that just because it's in a package that it doesn't transmit coronavirus. And who's like, the official richest man in the world now? It's Bezos, yeah. yeah. And doesn't he own like newspapers? He owns the Washington Post. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. So, I mean, and then another thing that I really think is cool that when you painted this, Johnny, is corn, right? You specifically used corn for a reason, right? I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. Do you want to talk about corn? Uh, I can talk I, about corn. I would rather you Drew talk. I well, I'm, more well I'm interested in, in what, um, I honestly, I don't know. Why, why did you use corn? Well, the name of the game was Bitcoin. Okay. But well, also, uh, I, yeah. you want me to say it? Or, you oh, okay. You so, corn is in almost everything okay you name a product Ooh. most likely it has corn in it and one of the i mean that's fine right you know use your resources whatever but one of the problems with corn nowadays is that instead of it, it is our food supply right so we are and this is why i have compassion for people that don't see the world the way that the three of us see it is because we are being manipulated and you know poisoned in multiple different ways one of those ways being the food supply now animals, uh, okay. meat, right? Cows, beef, probably in most countries other than the United States, meat is not like a huge part of what's on your plate. Meat is just like a side thing and they mostly mm -hmm. eat vegetables or whatever it is. But in the United States, meat is in almost every single meal. Now that's not by accident. And what they're feeding cows nowadays is they're feeding them instead of grass, they're feeding them corn. So what this does to a cow's body is it makes it so they have like just internal issues and the meat isn't as healthy. They're then they're feeding and there's GMOs in these corns, making the cows and making the animals grow fatter, faster. If you've ever seen GMO chickens, their legs break because they're so heavy that they can't even support their own body weight. But if you kill that chicken, you make way more money, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you are what you eat and you are eating animals that have only been eating corn byproducts, stuff with GMOs and they have issues, then this is why you have a, a population that's fat and dumb, right? Yeah. Fat, dumb, and unhappy. And then um, with, with cows, it's like if cows eat grass, I don't remember the exact sickness they get from eating corn, but if they eat grass, that sickness just automatically goes away. But with now that they eat corn, it's like they have there's this huge problem. And then also it's like people want to talk about environmental issues and they're like methane, right? Methane, the, the number one cause of methane is cows farting. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, why do cows have such stomach problems that they're releasing such methane? It's because they're eating food that they should not be eating, which is corn byproducts. Mm -hmm. So it's really it doesn't digest. Yeah, okay. there you go. Yeah. So a couple of things to add to that. Uh, on the on the cow front directly, the only reason that uh, we are talking about how other civilizations, they don't have meat in every meal. Why is that? It's because the costs are too high. Um, so how did we end up in a situation where our costs are low enough to have it in every meal? Um, like we were talking about um, feeding them corn, which is, you know, a uh, much uh, more cost efficient way. But the only reason that's even cost efficient is because the government subsidizes corn. Mm, so, um, so it's a, a artificial, it's not even an actual free market result. Um, it is a government interve intervention 
um, result. So there, that's one aspect. The second aspect, again, uh, is relates to Bill Gates, big investor in Monsanto. Um, and so people are familiar, I think, with um, kind of the GMO concept. But I know from my own experience in high school and college, the way that they have the schools present the argument to us is that it's, it's just crazy anti-science people that are, you know, they're just hating on genetically modified foods. But we've been we've been we've been genetically modifying through selective reproduction of these plants there for generations and generations. The difference is now the reason they're getting genetically modified is so that they can resist the extremely toxic pesticides that we spray on them. So when you're spraying that crazy toxic pesticide, glyphosate specifically, Roundup, um, which is owned by Monsanto, um, it's the, the plant survives. It kills all the, um, the insects, which are they're you know, slowly uh, becoming immune to it. But, uh, but yeah, no, recently, I believe it was last year, a uh, court in California found that glyphosate was in, in fact cancerous. Um, and that was it, granted in that instance, it was, um, it was like a groundskeeper was spraying it and then got skin cancer. So it was like an external thing, but just imagine what that does if you're digesting it. And it's in, it's in every food. They found it, baby food, Cheerios, um, and, and glyphosate is well much. Known. I mean, they came out that Monsanto's knew this. They had documents. They have known it for decades mm -hmm. that this was cancerous. Yeah. Uh, and the, also with the GMO, just to add to that, like some of my work's about patents and copyright. Mm -hmm. You know, like they'll patent these GMOs. Mm -hmm. They'll make these seeds, and they'll yep. make they'll make plants that don't produce seeds. Mm -hmm. So you have to buy new seeds. Mm -hmm. You can't just like heirloom your seeds like farmers have been doing for millennia. Wow. So you have to just keep buying from them. You become dependent on them. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's really bad stuff. I mean, they are – oh, yeah, I'm getting riled up just thinking about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And another thing just on Johnny's point there is that's when you hear, like, when you hear people like Bill Gates saying, oh, I'm donating billions of dollars to all these other countries – they're doing things like this yeah. where they're giving, oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to give you a bunch of seeds. Oh, but they're Monsanto uh, patented seeds. So you got to get them from us and there's no way you can, um, you know, it's not a self-sustaining thing. So, uh, so yeah, that's, a, that's another aspect. Uh, and then the other thing is Monsanto was just bought by Bayer, um, German chemical company, um, which uh, Bayer was actually the ones who produced, um, the uh, gas for the gas chambers in Nazi Germany. Um, they are a German company. They were part of uh, the uh, German cartel, chemical cartel, IG Farben, which was uh, related to the Rockefellers. Uh, they were they entered into a cartel with IG Farben. Uh, Wall Street, uh, the American Wall Street helped form IG Farben. They did all the work to consolidate the German firms. And then IG Farben uh, uh, actually picked out Hitler. And they had, um, uh, there was a Senate investigation in 1947. Um, and basically, uh, so post-war, they were doing, there's a guy named Senator uh, Homer T. Bone. And he has a quote that uh, Farben was Hitler and Hitler was Farben. So, so what I'm saying is Monsanto is uh, directly related to, uh, to Hitler and the Nazis, but the Monsanto themselves made, Hitler. they made, yeah, <laughs> Monsanto themselves also, uh, they made Agent Orange, which was used um, to, in chemical warfare uh, in Vietnam and still leads to crazy um, birth defects in Vietnam to this day. Yeah. So I horrible companies, total disregard for human life and it, I mean, if, they're, if they care about human life, they sure aren't showing it because they continue to profit from it. Yeah, but, and yeah. What's important to note is that we need to be asking these questions, right? Because it's like, for example, we cannot trust that just because somebody comes from this idea that they are the authority or they are the government or they are this long standing billion dollar company, that they have the best intentions. Now, taking intentions even out of it, we can't even say that they're the smartest or that they have the best technology, or that they have uh, thought of everything before putting it out. So you think about vaccines, like the MMR vaccine used to be legal in the United States, and they used to require kids to get it. But now it's completely illegal in the United States. 
but actually, I don't know if it's illegal. So, but, so that's a specific. Yeah. Um, that's a specific. Uh, I believe it was GlaxoSmithKline, however you say that that name. Um, they did make a. They made an MMR vaccine in. I believe it was uh, 1986. They released it in both the U.S. and Canada. It was banned in '88. Mm -hmm. uh, that same year, they repackaged it and sold it in Britain. Um, and it was called uh, Pluser X originally, and then they changed it to Triviex when they re-released it in Britain. Um, it continued to cause the extreme permanent brain damage over there, and the government knew about it. There's government, there's FOIA requested government uh, documents that have now been released that show the British government knew that this vaccine was extremely harmful, and they continued to uh, to allow it. I believe they they let it go for four years, and they only took it off the shelves in 1992. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's just another example about how these chemical companies, which are making our food and drugs, uh, they don't always have our uh, best interests in mind. I, I think they, from my research, they never had. Yeah. And no one goes to jail. That's, yeah, that's, that's the, the thing. Problem. No one's going to jail for any of this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Del Bigtree, who runs the hot, the High Wire, and he did that movie Vaxxed. If you guys have ever seen it, it's free to watch online. So I would definitely check that out if you're interested in learning more about vaccines. But he had a case against the CDC and the FDA uh, against vaccines, basically saying that there was no quality control in them being pushed out. And he won. So he won a case against the CDC and the FDA for vaccines. So definitely important. Uh, definitely important, but yeah, let's. Yeah, you want the next picture, or do you want to wrap up this one? Do you want to show uh, that uh, the, the latest piece? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So now, now, uh, Moon Time says like, uh, I came for the art, but I stayed for the hidden occult knowledge. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So we. Well, all right, and I will share. Here, I got it. Okay. Uh, let me pull it onto okay. really and quick this screen here. All right, and then. No. Well, actually, all right, cool. So you can show. Show it twice. Okay, I Let's will see. show the painting and then we'll show the latest piece. Let's do stop screen here and then I'm gonna do share screen and then I'm going to do this screen. Perfect. Okay. Okay, Perfect. bring it to the, is it the beginning? Right. And let's see, you put the headphones in to see if we can hear it. And click. All right, could you bring it to the start at the beginning? There we go. Okay. That's the beginning? Yep. Can you hear it? Perfect. Cool. They should be able to hear it then online. So interpretation, guys. This is great. Let's see if I can hide this and we'll just play it over and again. Um, so this is my latest piece. Uh, it's from an old painting. I've made an animation for it. it this is, is the original right here on the front. And now it's animated. This is cool. So yeah, if you, uh, it's AR, if you have the book or the art or print, you can put your phone over it and this will play. Uh, it's called Puppet Show. I think it's uh, self-explanatory. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if for any viewers internationally, the, uh, the elephant and the donkey are the mascots of the Democratic and Republican Party here in uh, the United States. Uh, some are called, um, yeah, they're the same party. Um, mm -hmm. on lots of levels. It's an illusion and it, of choice. It's an illusion. It's a puppet show. And just everyone's entertained. Everything's falling apart around them. But uh, hey, they just do that dance. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. You know, really the big thing that annoys me right now is when people who only recently started paying attention mm -hmm. want to come in and say like, oh, the government's so bad right now. And they want to blame everything. The last 70 freaking years or whatever. Mm -hmm on the current administration and i'm just like did you just start paying attention because if you mm -hmm. did you don't realize that there is a, co a complete buildup as to why there are all these issues you can't blame it on like it's so frustrating because like i'm a huge proponent who's like the government has too much power too much power too much power too much power mm -hmm. and now people that are jumping on that bandwagon of things that us like we the people like us three have been sharing for so long i mean they are saying the same message, but they're directing it towards the wrong people. Yeah, those yeah, those type of people are you know ultimately being driven by their hatred of a of a certain political figure, whether that be caused by the media, one hundred percent is twenty four seven. But um, 
they're, which is great. I mean, God bless them. They're, you know, waking up. I'm glad you guys finally noticed what was going on. Um, but, but yeah, no, I think it's important. You got to, um, you got to zoom out. So this, said, I think that's what makes this, uh, what makes this so great is not only do you see that, you know, both sides are, um, are being uh, ultimately controlled by a puppet master. You also get the fact that the masses are so enthralled by the constant show that they don't notice above them, the security state watching them and then the Statue of Liberty falling over, um, which is, yeah, yeah, beautiful stuff. And I think um, the audio, which hopefully, uh, I think we are trying to get it to, to go through, hopefully it is, but it's like the do 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 like it's just a big circus. So yeah, um, so yeah. No. Well, just, you know the old saying, bread and circuses. Mm, yeah. Uh, and do you know that saying, Erica? Uh, bread and circuses. Yeah. Mm -mm, I do not. Um, it's an old saying, uh, or in for the uh, the Latins, pani uh, toros. Okay. It's an old expression that was uh, bread and bulls. Uh -huh. uh, but bread and circuses. Uh, Gladiators used to have like three gladiators at a time. That was a circus. Mm -hmm. So they would bring on the gladiators to entertain the Romans. And they'd give, if they had their entertainment and their bread, they didn't care about the government. They didn't care what was happening. You know, and kind of like, you know, now, you know, mm -hmm. NFL and, and, you know, and your chicken wings. Hey, I don't care what's happening in the world. Yeah. And one of the things, you know, you just mentioned that people are starting to pay attention. It's because they can't watch sports anymore. Exactly. Yeah. It's crazy because like you think the people that are pulling the strings, these hands, you know, in the, in the picture, you think they would be smarter than that, right? You think they would keep, oh, sports, keep playing, keep playing, keep playing so you can keep the people distracted while all this other stuff is happening. But in reality, it's like, I think I heard somebody at the, at the Bitcoin Center say this today, because the sports have ceased, they start paying attention because there's not, what else are they going to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and which is ultimately, you know, I can see on a higher level um, how right now that's being, you know, weaponized where there's no sports. So now we can, you know, people are paying attention. Um, so now they've made sure to make it so um, what they're paying attention to is the most divisive um, politics and especially the most divisive events, possibly, you know, violent rioting and looting um, is you know, that's ultimately, um, so there's, Johnny talked about bread and circus, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that dates back to Roman times, like we were talking about gladiators. Um, there's another expression, divide and conquer, which is um, basically you get uh, how a small group rules a very large group of people is the small group gets the large group to fight each other. And while the people are fighting each other on the streets, they never have time to look up and see you laughing at them from your skyscrapers. So that's essentially, um, you know, again, that's another uh, theme of what's going on in this picture right here. Yeah, definitely. All of these people are not looking at the hands. <laughs> They're not even on the same field as the hands. They are looking directly at this donkey and elephant. Do you guys know why it's a donkey and elephant, by the way? I'm just curious. No, and we'll have to look that up for the next for the next digital art and digital times stream. Uh, but we are coming up on the hour. Any closing messages from you, and then I'll let you close out, Johnny? Um, hmm, I was trying to think of other things I wanted to add earlier that we didn't get to. Um, just on the Facebook front, um, you know, we we're talking about surveillance and stuff like that, um, and how ultimately, you know, Facebook right now is being used. Um, uh, to not only control, you know, people's emotions like we were talking about, but also to do very targeted ads. Um, I think it's important to know um, that uh, there was a DARPA, which is the uh, U.S. military intelligence, very secretive technology program. Um, they had a project called LifeLog. Um, and LifeLog was actually, they shut down the program the day that Mark Zuckerberg announces the launch of uh, the Facebook. Um, and later, later LifeLog, uh, LifeLog employees, people who were working on LifeLog for DARPA, later went on to work for uh, Facebook. Um, and actually, really funny, uh, DARPA, the official DARPA Twitter account, actually was arguing with people about this exact thing on uh, Twitter. They totally got dunked on because, like, they're just like, no, no, it's just a coincidence. We have a lot of people who, like, 
who end up going to work for the private sector afterwards. This wasn't a government project. We don't want to. We don't want to get you. So LifeLog, obviously, the as the name implies, the government wanted us. You know, wanted a way to get people to give them give all their private information away so that they could you know keep tabs on everybody. But. Ilya, yeah. shout out to you. You're such a jerk sometimes, but I actually, your girlfriend's and your wife is really cute. So I'm going to be nice to you. But I only asked if you, if it, obviously the picture is a donkey and elephant because it's the Republican and the Democrat party. But if you know why it rep those images and those particular pictures represent the Democratic party, please share your knowledge since you know everything. <laughs> but anyways, uh, yeah, no, that's a really good point that DARPA, Facebook, like this is, this is not, there, there are a lot of things that are going behind the scenes that these hands are doing and we don't know. And it's very, very traceable. You know, the fact that, that Facebook opened and that was the day DARPA closed, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that you have someone who's in like high level government in Monsanto, they, they like their wife works for Monsanto or is like the head of some C-suite executive of Monsanto, but they're also like the representative in some state, right? So all of these things are trackable. They're very, very present. It's just, you know, do you care enough to look? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think most importantly, looking up, I think is a great, another great takeaway from Johnny's piece here. Um, like we were talking about, you know, people fighting in the streets, they don't have time to look up and see who's, you know, benefiting from the division that they're participating in. Yeah, definitely. Johnny, any closing thoughts? Uh, it's been fun. Been like to do it again sometime. Always yeah. fun to hang out with my friends at the Blockchain Center. Um, closing statements. Um, yeah, this new piece is just done. This, you guys are the first guys to see it. Um, I am tokenizing it and going to drop it later this week. You can find that. I'll be posting the link on Twitter um, at Johnny Dollar Art on Twitter. Follow him, guys. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's been great. I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed it. Cool. Well, thank you everybody for joining. We, if you like this, let us know. We'll do something like this again for sure, especially while you're here. Drew's normally in where, well, you don't share this on the internet, but <laughs> yeah, Johnny's, don't share this on the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> digital times for digital age, protect yourself in many different ways. And now we have cool digital art. Do you want to show them really fast, Johnny, how it, it appears sure. on your phone? Here, let's just, what I'll do is I'll turn this towards you, this uh, camera. He's been in the same room as the whole time. And uh, we have this book, which is the original version of this here. Let me actually go like this. Okay. So we have this book okay. and you just want to show them. Okay. Is it the very one? Just look at this one here. All right. I'll so I use this app called Art of Vive right here. And what it does is, let me hold this for you. Oh, um, anyway, okay, if you can tell. Here, and then you take that. There you go. So it makes an animation. I've added augmented reality, basically. Um, uh, to the painting. So, uh, yeah, so you can see if you get the book, you get the app, you get all the animations that come with it. So the, the, the artwork is gaining in value because um, I'm having fun with animation and in these times, probably be doing more digital art. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's been great. Uh, thanks for checking out Art at the Blockchain Center. <laughs> and I'll send it back to Erica. Bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you. See you again. Ilya, no worries. But yeah, you're going to be trolled, but it's cool. Anyways, thank you. Please check out Johnny Dollar's stuff online. He is selling art. He's here in Miami. If you're here, come check out his studio. He has a studio right across the street from the Blockchain Center. That's a lot of really great stuff and is moving into the digital arts scene. You guys probably already know Drew. Drew is a wealth of knowledge here and definitely happy to have him. Definitely happy to have a lot of like finds. If you've never visited the Blockchain Center before, please come check us out at blockchaincenter.com. Subscribe to our mailing list and follow us on channels because we're going to be doing more videos like this. Okay, bye.